This is the US Japan Bridging Foundation's uh, webinar series that we've been doing on a variety of career topics. And uh, I wanted to mention uh, a little bit about our sponsor. Um, which is indeed, but first I do want to welcome our two panelists. Um, we have dancer and choreographer Cameron McKinney. So give him a wave, Cameron, and uh, educator, moving image educator and filmmaker Tom Flint. Nice to have you both with us. And I'll tell you a lot more about them in just a moment. Um, but first I am going to do uh, a little bit about our fabulous sponsors at Indeed and uh, Recruit Holdings. So um, Lara, who's behind the scenes, if you would just help me out here for a minute, I just wanna let you all know um, that Indeed and Recruit Holdings is our sponsor and they're actually um, a Japanese com company. They went public um, in 2012 and uh, they were acquired by Recruit Holdings at, at that time. And they were founded in the United States in 2004 in Austin, Texas and Stanford, Connecticut. And their Indeed's mission is to get people jobs, which is great. Um, and I know a lot of the folks watching are interested in expanding their careers, maybe getting that next job. So we're gonna show you a little bit about how you do that. Um, and we've got a website up here and you can type in what you're interested in in the what box. Um, and maybe you're interested in Japan and then maybe you wanna search for a job in New York. Um, and so you can do that you can scroll around and see what jobs are available in New York that relate to Japan. Um, you could put in other kinds of keywords like Japanese language. Um, you can even put in other locations. Um, one of the other things that you can do is if you want to, you can search for jobs uh, in Japan. So you can go to the Japanese site um, and you can search for jobs there. So that's another uh, way to do your search. You can also use the Indeed Resume Builder, which is a free online tool. So if you're feeling a little sketchy about that resume and you wanna beef that up, they have a great tool that sort of walks you through uh, and will get your resume in good shape. And the other thing you might wanna do is put a job alert. Uh, you can put a job alert with keywords. So if there are words like Japan, Japanese language, Japanese culture, uh, dance that we're talking about today, filmmaking, you can put all those keywords in and find a job that relates to your interests. Um, so we're, and we're even excited to know that they have a career uh, advice page as well. So. If you need a little bit of extra advice about your career and you wanna read some blog posts, um, you can certainly do that. So we wanna thank Indeed and Recruit Holdings um, for bringing um, this wonderful webinar series to us. It's a perfect example of sort of US Japan bridging in terms of business. So thank you so much to our sponsors. And now without further ado, I wanna introduce our panelists and let me kick off by just asking each one of you um, tell our audience about a particular project that you're working on that really excites you. And why is that? Let me start with you, Cameron. Yeah, well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, really excited and grateful just to have a chance to talk about my work. Um, so my company uh, tours internationally and nationally as well. And the project we're working on right now is actually a whole new evening of work that we're going to be presenting at the Middlebury uh, Japanese Summer Language School next summer in June. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and also commissioning some new artists, uh, new choreographers to set work on the company that's also inspired along with the rest of our repertory by aspects of the Japanese language and culture. Nice. And Tom, let me turn it to you. Um, what's something you're working on right now that really jazzes you? Sure. Um, I mean, there's a number of different projects, but something that I'm working on right now that's really exciting to me is um, it's still in the planning stages, but it's basically trying out a new application with the, um, the program I run called Film Building, which is essentially cross-cultural filmmaking. And for the most part, up until now, I've worked with um, youth and children uh, overseas, getting kids from different countries and parts of the world to collaborate on projects together. But seeing as we're having quite a few problems uh, over here on our own turf um, in terms of division and whatnot. Um, I'm just trying to see what we might be able to do with film building in order to get youth and children from different parts of this own country um, to, to work together on film projects. So, um, I mean, cross-cultural filmmaking is, is not just about bringing 
kids from different nationalities together. It's, you know, different, different backgrounds. So they go to different schools, um, different parts of the country. So I think that's something that I'm really excited about and hopefully I'll be able to get somewhere with it. So. It sounds much needed. Um, this let's, before we really dig into both, what both of you are doing in your careers right now, how about we show people rather than tell them? So since Tom, um, we just spoke to you, how about we show them uh, a little clip of uh, what you're doing with film builders? That is really great. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about that. Um, and I want to ask you first how you got interested in Japan and what is that connection to your film building world? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it, would, it would probably go back to when I was in university um, at Temple University in Philly. Um, and I was studying film there. And um, I just kind of became more and more interested in foreign cinema uh, through watching a lot of different um, film projects. And if you're into foreign cinema and you're exploring uh, world cinema, um, it doesn't take you long to hit Japanese cinema. So um, once I did that, I was able to discover the work of, of for example, Akira Kurosawa, uh, Yasujiro Ozu, and realized that these were two radically different filmmakers that happened to hail from the same country. Um, so I um, became more interested in Japan. I applied for a study abroad program with Temple, um, which was actually the first um, American university to establish a uh, branch campus over in Japan, I think in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And I went over to, um, to study uh, back in 2003, uh, my final semester of, of college in Tokyo. And I studied under um, the, the great Donald Ritchie, um, who, who passed away about 10 years ago, but he was a very um, kind of, you know, important figure in um, writing about both Japanese cinema and also Japanese culture. I think he wrote over 50 books. Um, so that um, turned into kind of this exploration of Japan. Um, I started to dig, 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 not only into Japanese film, but into Japanese culture. And I realized that you, you never really hit rock bottom. Um, there's always things that will continue to fascinate me about Japan. Um, so um, I continued making um, um, films over in Japan as a filmmaker. The first project I worked on um, was a film that was adapted from a short story written by um, Haruki Murakami. Um, and uh, my largest project there was something I directed and wrote um, and shot back in 2014, I think it was, it was called The Shadow Inside. Um, and if we have time a little bit later, I can, I can play a, a clip from that or a trailer. Um, but that was my kind of um, introduction to Japan was all the way back in college through, through Japanese cinema. Wow. And Cameron, you also got connected to Japan in college. Is that right? I actually started a little bit earlier. So I started this summer before my freshman year of high school. Okay. Um, and I originally got into it through actually hearing some Japanese music and it was just confusing and wonderful and beautiful. Um, and went to the library, did the books about learning the basic hiragana characters, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then my mom stumbled across the Concordia language villages um, in Minnesota. So I did this immersive program the first summer before I went to freshman year of high school and uh, did it for four weeks, spoke nothing but Japanese, struggled all the time, but got addicted, uh, studied in high school, went back to the camp every summer, um, wound up being a counselor there. And so when I went to college at Middlebury in Vermont, uh, I went there with the intention to 
continue studying Japanese, but then discovered dance there as well. So. Wow. And then you merged the two. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't we show a little clip of just you teaching a workshop just to give people a little bit of a sense of what your dance is like. Okay. Hang on. Let me share this. Wow, that is just mesmerizing. Is that not completely mesmerizing everybody? It's so fluid. Yeah, everybody's saying how amazing it is. Um, so tell people a little bit about the movement and you know where this, where this draws from and give us a little bit of background. Sure, so I came into dance um, from watching dance movies and um, you know, went to college, wanted to start something new. Uh, so I started off in street dance and hip hop, um, specifically uh, popping, waving, and then eventually worked my way into house, which is where I kind of specialize now. Um, and yes, to someone who said capoeira, I did take capoeira in college, so that there is a major influence for that too. Um, but then the college program taught modern um, and a little bit of contemporary as well. And so when I came out of college, I had this weird amalgamation of street dance, but also contemporary and um, I also majored in Japanese and dance as a joint major in college. So my thesis was on trying to find um, psychological, but also um, somatic and anatomical similarities between uh, buto, the Japanese style buto, and street dance. And so I did that for my thesis and then continued um, working on the development of that kind of style through um, an uh, Asian Cultural Council grant and um, through my own personal studies and things like that. So that's still the ongoing process that I'm working on. but. So what's interesting to me is that both of you um, have talked about sort of Japanese values as well as Japanese aesthetic as kind of rooting a lot of your work. And I, I'm wondering if um, Cameron, you could speak to that first and then Tom, if you could tell us more about how that affects your work. Yeah, so, you know, when I graduated college, um, like I said, I did dance in Japanese and I really just wanted to continue doing both of those things. Um, I originally went to college with the idea of being a politician, which is kind of funny now, um, but um, I'm so interested in the um, power that the arts holds for cultural ambassadorship. So in my work that, the that I do with the company, um, each of the works that we do is inspired by some aspect um, of the Japanese language or culture. So um, we've done works about the Art Deco movement in Japan. We've done works um, about untranslatable words. Uh, we do things like translating kanji characters into uh, uh, pathways on the floor and series of movements, uh, things like that. Um, and with the study of Buto, I'm really interested in the body mind centering aspect that comes along with it. Um, and also just the similarities between Buto as a style, you know, coming up uh, after the uh, US occupation of Japan and Japan like trying, uh, Japanese dancers like trying to get a sense of what is uniquely Japanese in the wake of that kind of overwhelming American presence and the similarities that that holds between um, street dance starting in New York with the black and Latino people uh, also trying to reclaim their national their identity in the wake of gentrification in New York. So I find a lot of connections between um, the sense of rebellion at the start of those but then I'm trying to bring that kind of body mind centering side of Buto into the street dance aesthetic and then combine that with a contemporary aesthetic. So it's, it's a lot to kind of like wrap your head yes. around, but it's a, it's a <laughs> continual process for sure. <laughs> but, but that's what I, I'm so intrigued by is that, you know, you're, you're drawing together so many different threads in your work. Um, and Tom, I've, I see that as well in the work that you're doing, both, you know, bringing kids together through work and then your own film work. I mean, tell us a little bit more about the Japanese aesthetic, but also kind of the principles that um, you're Sure, familiar. sure. So, I mean, as you mentioned in the beginning, I'm, I'm both a film educator and also a film artist. Um, so those are things that I've kept up with for, for quite a long time. But I, I would say as a film artist, it's, it's difficult, I think, to to figure out exactly 
which part of all that is coming from these traditional Japanese philosophies, aesthetics, and um, and uh, traditions. But I would say that something that's quite central to um, the way I approach both um, filmmaking and film teaching is the um, it has a lot to do with the willingness to kind of let go and relinquish control, which is something that you find, um, you know, in very fundamental Japanese and in, in Eastern uh, traditions. So I think, um, you know, one example is just accepting things the way they are. And rather than trying to manipulate everything, which is what film is most often seen as, as a, as a very manipulative form of art where you're setting everything up in front of the camera and you're mm -hmm. kind of telling the actors where to walk and so on. It has a lot to do with, um, compromising with whatever the the world is kind of giving to you. And of course, there are Japanese film artists um, like Ozu, for example, that, that are very manipulative and have a very clear vision of what they want inside the frame. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are, are Western film artists like, you know, John Cassavetes, who are who use a much more organic process. But I think on the whole, you you tend to see a lot of um, Japanese filmmakers that that um, are kind of finding ways to incorporate um, uh, things the way they are into their projects. And that's something I try to do as well. So um, I would say with my earlier film projects, it had a lot to do with kind of realizing my own vision and how to translate that into a film. Um, but now it's, it's a lot more about um, just kind of letting go, uh, letting go of that and um, trying to lean more into the collaborative process and um, working more closely with collaborators and, um, and, and, and so on. And I think that that parallels a lot with my work as an educator. Um, you know, filmmaking, I think, tends to overemphasize planning. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into the pre-production phase of making a movie, yes. um, which is based on all kinds of things related to capitalism and, and how much money you can make. Um, but when you're in a classroom space, um, there's so much thrill that, that goes into the actual kind of um, filming of the, of, of the movie. So I think the more you can take advantage of that part of the process, uh, I, you know, I, I think it, it'll be a lot more rewarding for younger people. So we look at, you know, forms of an intuitive exploration um, and self cultivation. And, um, you know, there's a bunch of examples that I think are kind of wrapped into this more discovery based approach that have to do with, you know, finding beauty in you know, irregularity and imperfection, things that are found, for example, in Wabi Sabi, or um, the power of suggestion, um, which is something that you see throughout a lot of Japanese art, um, or, you know, um, re reflexive thinking, transcendence of ego. So it's very different from how films are normally made in the industry, where it's very, you know, doing things by the book and a lot of uh, pre-planning. Right. You mentioned um, sort of cultural connections, and I wanted to bring Cameron into that conversation because Cameron, you've been um, working on the sort of cultural ambassador side of, of the picture too. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's been, you know, like I said, I, I have this, this kind of inner dream of, of being a politician of some kind, maybe a, in a different universe. Um, I, maybe, I a am diplomat. One, but maybe, maybe a diplomat. diplomat, maybe a diplomat is a better word. I like that. Yeah. But I think, <laughs> I think the idea of, of trying to bring people, you know, trying to bring like an American audience closer to the Japanese culture and vice versa is something that's always appealed to me. I mean, the cult, the Japanese language has essentially been the cause of all the best things that have happened to me in my life. So it holds a, holds a very special place. And I kind of just want people to, um, to be more, uh, to know more about it and to be more excited about it. Um, and the Asian Cultural Council Fellowship I mentioned very briefly that I had in 20, uh, 2019 um, was kind of the first step toward that. And then the next step that we're working on now um, is a fellowship that I'm currently engaged in with the United States Japan Friendship Commission um, with another choreographer um, named Toru Shimazaki based in Japan. And, um, you know, that whole project is really about how do we get American-based artists and Japanese artists together in a room to collaborate, to share their life experiences, and to create create art from that. Um, shared on both continents, you know, going back and forth, um, connecting with his dancers, collaborating with his dancers, performing with his dancers, um, and also having a language aspect to that as well. With the company um, being introduced to Japanese through the uh, Middle Bay Language School in Vermont, um, and learning how to not only uh, 
translate experiences that these Japanese dancers have had, but also to begin to speak their language, right? And to meet them uh, closer to where they are, um, as many Japanese people have taken English, right? Um, so just trying to build those artistic bridges um, with the end goal of having the company serve as this artistic vessel for uh, Japanese and American-based artists to connect and collaborate um, and just build more bridges. That's fantastic. Tom, did you want to jump in on that? Because I know you're building bridges as well. Yeah, so um, going back to my work with, with film building, it really is about um, using the co-creative aspects of filmmaking to get youth from different parts of the world together. Um, and I've worked a lot with um, students in both the US and in Japan. Um, the first film building workshop I had um, back in 2018, right after I graduated from a, a master's program in art and design education, involved uh, a, a group of Japanese high school students, which I had taught. Um, they were up in Gunma Prefecture, north of Tokyo. Um, it involved them coming to the, the greater Boston area, uh, spending a couple of weeks here, and teaming up with, um, with a group of uh, American students. And we basically put um, all of these, it was about 15 students, about half from, from each country, um, into a, a few different groups and gave them a theme, um, which for that workshop was in between. And we sent them out to these different locations without any scripts or any you know, explanation of how to make a film because that's something that they were to explore um, by themselves. Um, and they worked in these, these cross-cultural groups, getting to know each other over this um, several day period. And it was a lot of problem solving. It was a lot of um, just kind of discovering about each other's cultures um, and their own cultures for that matter through the process of putting a film together. And I mean, I think film lends itself so well to being this, this invitation to, to get people together and exchange you know, ideas and, and viewpoints. And when you're on a professional film set, a quote unquote professional film set, you very rarely get to see that because it's very hierarchical. Um, it's, it's driven by this kind of auteur um, vision. What's the vision of the director? But um, I, I tend to use the word co-create. All of the students that are taking part in the process are co-creators. They're all directors. They're all cinematographers. They're all actors. And um, rather than giving them very specific directions, we kind of leave it up to them. And it's very empowering, I think. Um, so film, I think, um, on one hand, it is about appreciating cinema and kind of pushing the bounds of what film can be as an art. But on the other hand, it's about really kind of opening yourself up and going back to letting go and um, mm -hmm. um, you know, seeing uh, what you can learn through the process. Well, we have a couple questions already um, and folks try to remember to put them in the Q&A. That helps me to um, keep track of them rather than the chat, um, but I'll grab one off the chat. Um, for Cameron, have you worked with other Japanese artists, dancers, actors, musicians in classical, traditional or folk genres outside of Buto? Um, and could you talk about ways in which these interactions or collaborations have taken place? And we even have some footage of one, so <laughs> well played. Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, my main focus um, while I've been over in Japan has been on the Buto side. That's what I get the funding to explore while I'm over there. Um, but uh, there are some there are some things where we're working on in terms of connecting with uh, Japanese classical composers um, and also visual artists as well for future collaborations. Um, you know, it actually. It's funny because you know this this idea of the arts cultural ambassadorship has always been kind of deeply rooted in my own um, goals, but something that hasn't really come out into the uh, come out and manifested itself as strongly um, as a com uh, until the recently until the last like couple of years essentially. Because um, at first I was just here, just trying to survive and make make work in New York and hope everything was okay. Um, and as we've come to build a larger community here, and our work is being seen more, and um, we've really come into our own as a company, but also myself as a choreographer, I've shifted this focus from just wanting just to make work and have it be seen to really wanting the work to be a vessel toward connecting people together. Um, and so as I've transferred over to that kind of mission. Um, I've been putting more and more feelers out through doing these kinds of fellowship and actually traveling more to Japan as well um, to collaborate with people like that. So um, it's definitely, definitely on the plate. 
Um, and I don't, I don't know if you, if you want to show that the clip from. Yeah, I yeah. was thinking so we could. Is this maybe the... um, you could show the Awasa Kagami clip. Um, okay. This actually is Buto related, so this is uh, maybe not quite to your question, but um, when I was over doing the um, Asian Cultural Council Fellowship, I got to train and study with uh, members of Sankai Juku, um, and we did a performance at the end. So just like a little snippet of me uh, doing that performance. All right, here's a little snippet. Yeah. Super sure. Wow. Yeah, gives us a, a great little taste, though. Um, and I'm, um, uh, we've got another question here, and either one of you could probably speak to this. For anybody who has taught or studied in Japan, what level of language proficiency would you recommend for someone wanting to study abroad, um, or maybe just wanting to visit, um, or maybe teach English? That's about six questions in one. And we tackled some of those in a previous webinar, so you want to check that out. But just in terms of your proficiency, um, Tom and Cameron, you know, what what would you suggest to people who want to visit and explore? Yeah, I, I, I think it um, it really depends on what your what your personal goals are. Um, it's absolutely possible to um, travel to to Japan and live in a city like Tokyo and and kind of get by. Um, that's essentially what I did for you know when I when I first went to Japan as a student. I didn't know any Japanese. Um, I was kind of in a different boat from from Cameron because I hadn't studied before going there. Um, but I was lucky lucky enough to spend the first six or so months of my life in Japan uh, with a host family. So it kind of thrust me into the situation of having to learn the language, which is the best way to learn. Right. Um, so if the primary goals, I think, are to learn the language and um, find work, um, obviously, I think um, for finding work, the bigger cities would probably make more sense just because there are more opportunities. But for learning the language, I would say go way out into the boondocks, go to, go to Niigata, go to Hokkaido, um, go to Aomori, go to Kagoshima, and um, kind of do the same thing that, that I did, where which is to put yourself in a situation where you have no choice but to speak Japanese. Right. Um, but it, it goes back to I think personal goals. But I, I think Japan provides so many so many different opportunities to to find yourself and to discover new things. So um, right. yeah. And we did do a session um, on the JET program. So if you're interested in that specific program and teaching English in Japan, you can check out uh, the website, the US Japan Bridging Foundation. Just click on webinars and you can get a link to that past uh, webinar where I think you'll get a lot of information. Over to you, Cameron. What about your experiences with language? Yeah, I was going to say the same, you know, if you're if you don't know this much, you know, the bigger cities, uh, you'll have signs that have English under them, you'll have people who speak English around. Um, I came into it from a different perspective because I had studied the language for maybe eight years or so before I went there the first time. Um, and, you know, if you have the time, I would suggest, like, I would just really take that time to learn as much as you can before you get there because there's something so special about going there and speaking to people in, in their language. And it really, um, it really opens doors in terms of connecting with people professionally, sure, but really more so just personally. Like, there's, like people want to take you to the places that mean something to them when you've taken that time to understand their world in that sense. Um, so, I mean, the more you can get, it's, very, it's kind of a difficult language to like jump into, but uh, the more you can, you can get under your belt, you know, even the little bits and pieces um, I think for some people, it really means a lot uh, to, to go that route, um, but definitely go larger cities and I'm all for the immersion route, like definitely go all the way out there, like go to an island, you know, <laughs> and really just throw yourself deep in it and you, you will come out with just um, a really deeper appreciation and a, and a deeper connection to the, to the language itself, like you'll skip that step of translating English to Japanese and, you know, you'll just like right. see something and already know the Japanese for it instead of trying to run through the extra step of translation in your head. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if I could just quickly add on to what Cameron was saying, I, I think it's probably the case with all languages around the world where they're inextricably connected to the 
you know, the culture of that part of the world. But I think in the case of Japanese, there's something in, in you may agree with this, Cameron, there's something really special about the connection between the language of Japan and the culture of Japan, where if you're learning the language, it really does allow you to, to access different um, cultural tidbits and understand the, the Japanese mind a lot better, which helps you communicate and understand the art and um, just the whole cadence of the, of the nation. Um, so I think, I mean, another reason to, to study um, Japanese before going there, I think, um, yeah. Well, and somebody asked, now this is a very specific question. We may not be able to solve visa issues here on this webinar, but how can I become an artist, specifically an animator in Japan and handle the visa situation? Should I go with a tourist visa and hope to be hired or you know, get hired and then go? You know, so, and that's a pretty big question. I will say before you guys um, throw out answers that we did talk about um, manga and animation in one of our previous webinars. It's a fabulous session um, with two people who are very knowledgeable about that. So check that out. Um, Lara just put the link in the, uh, in, the, in the chat so you can go to previous webinars and play them. But do you have any suggestions? Is it better to go there and look for a job while you're there and, and then, or just how would you recommend? I'm going to bow out of answering that question. I'm not the person that okay. <laughs> I don't yes. want to give anybody any like really bad advice and get you stuck in Japan. Attaches at the embassy if you want to yeah. talk about visa. I figured you guys would say that, but I just didn't know if you had any experience of like going. I, I think this is a general question right now worldwide, really, whether mm. when people, you know, they kind of want to potentially apply for a job. I mean, my son is going through the same process right now and should he just go live in the country I mean, he's actually lived there before in his case and then just and find the job while he's there or try to get something before you go and it's I think it's a really hard question I think you have to sort of jump in with both feet is sort of my recommendation but I'm a I'm a non-risk averse person I think all three of us being entrepreneurs and creatives <laughs> are probably not the right people to ask when it comes to taking risk yeah I mean I yeah I I agree with but each of you are saying. Um, but no, I, I would say that, you know, um, Japan and the US do fortunately have a, a pretty, a very strong diplomatic relationship, which does make it a lot easier for um, Americans to do the kind of thing that that question is asking, which is, can I just go to Japan on a tourist visa, which I think is still three months. Mm -hmm. And um, during that three month period, look for a right. job. Right. And that's absolutely possible. Um, in fact, that's what I did after I finished my semester in Japan, moved back to the US and then moved back to Japan to live, which was in 2004. And you may have to come back in between to get the proper visa to return. So again, we're not I would say, making recommendations to do things illicitly. <laughs> I would say also as a potential avenue, you know, I would maybe look at fellowships like Fulbright, Asian Cultural Council, the USCFC, like if you can get a fellowship over there, they can help you with all of that one, but they also can support you for an extended amount of time where you can uh, get used to traveling in Japan, uh, go to some different places um, and kind of explore a little bit as you look for a job and do this fellowship. So it might be a way to have a supported trip over there, um, have some funds to help you get around and see some different places, but then um, not quite have as much pressure on you financially to uh, solve your job problem like right away. So and and a, as a follow on to that, all of those organizations have alumni associations, right? So just like mm -hmm. Jet has a, an alumni association, and we spoke to the head of that. Fulbright has an alumni association that's very robust. I mean, all these organizations have groups that are networks that can help you. Um, and expand your network of other people who love that country. So, you know, don't just think of it as a sort of just you by yourself trying to figure these things out. There's, there's a community of people in, in many places, including at the Bridging Foundation. So um, now one person said, um, well, I'll come back to that question, but let me ask you guys um, about, um, one thing I'm curious about is just you're both educating other people, right? You both teach, but what are you learning all the time? And tell, talk to us about the learning side of teaching. Cameron, you want to take that first? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the, the best teachers are, are students, right? Um, so for me as a dance maker working with um, people's bodies and 
and the history that's so um, you know deeply see, uh, seated in everyone's unique body. Um, I'm always learning with every new dancer I encounter, every uh, class I teach. I'm learning a different way to translate my aesthetic and my goals to someone with a different history physically than I am, than I have. Um, so that means basically, basically finding different ways to break everything down to its base level and then also learning different ways to relate to people to bring their own personal histories into the kind of movement that I'm trying to get across. So it's, it's basically um, a constant conversation and I almost have to relearn how to have that conversation with every single residency or even like even an hour and a half long class. I meet new people and you know you have no idea where they come from, what their histories are, um, and you're basically learning about them and then trying to bring that into your own aesthetic and how can you use uh, what they have and what they've experienced to bring out uh, the goal of the message your work is creating or to bring out um, something that they themselves would also like to express. So yeah, just I'm, I'm constantly like learning over and over again, basically. <laughs> and what about you, Tom? Yeah, yeah, I know. I think that's, that's such a great philosophy. And I think there's one, I mean, one aspect of, of, <clears throat> of Japanese culture, the Japanese mind that I really try to take to heart is that of, of modesty and humility. Um, you know, Japanese are just inherently very, very humble people. Um, it's just a part of their culture and the way they communicate. So I think trying to understand that and appreciate that puts, for me at least, puts me in a situation where I know that I'm always a student. I mean, you never, ever, ever get there. It's all about process, right? And learning. And I think I've had so many opportunities to learn from both my students and my, my companions on a film set, whether they're actors or, or, or crew members. And I think... Um, being in a situation where you don't think of yourself as a professional, but more of, of as an amateur and being willing to kind of admit that um, opens you up to, to, to learning a whole lot more and listening. And I think with my students, I love working with, um, with younger people, uh, both children and youth with, with my film building program, because, you know, when you grow up, you become an adult, you, you gain a lot of things, but you also lose a lot. And I mm -hmm. think kids just because they're kids, um, and they haven't had that range of experiences are, are willing to, to take, the, you know, different kind of risks that, that, that we wouldn't. And, um, they, they act very intuitively and, um, you know, they, they ask all kinds of questions that we tend to take for granted. And I think that's such a great attitude to have as an artist into your adulthood. Um, and, um, I think that's something I've definitely learned from, from my students is to just kind of go for it. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that's helped me immensely. Um, well, with, with I think also, I Tom, one of the things, um, just this is with my sort of filmmaker hat on, you know, is that cameras have gotten more accessible, right? Everybody has a camera, it's their phone. Um, and it doesn't have, you know, as many bells and whistles and, and menus as, uh, you know, as our professional cameras do, but it allows everybody to just try it you know? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a common question that, you know, I get as a film artist is, you know, how do I, how do I make it as a filmmaker? And I basically <laughs> tell students um, that it's, it's very easy to just go out there and make a film. Everything is available to you nowadays. There are no more excuses um, right. like there were, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, you have a camera that can shoot pretty high quality footage right. on your phone. Right. Um, you have, you know, really high quality editing software that you can download for And the free. new iPhone has three different lenses. So don't complain about lenses. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And of course, that's not to say that, you know, trying to break into the film industry is an easy, easy thing to do. It's no. not, no. but all you really need, and this is what I try to convey to my students through the program is um, a camera and imagination and um, people to do it with, because I think filmmaking does take a village. Um, like, you know, all the Absolutely. collaborative arts, but I think especially right. in filmmaking. Right. So don't try and change the way you want to tell a story, mm -hmm. um, but find people that, that agree with you and are kind of on the same page and go out there and, and just do it. Um, mm -hmm. And then you, you get it done and then you move on from there. So tell me, Cameron, about storytelling through dance, because to me, dance also tells a story. Um, explain a little bit about how you do that when you're choreographed choreographing a dance? Yeah, um, so I go about it in many different ways. I mean, each process is a little bit different. Um, 
but at least in my most of my processes, I, I think about cultivating an atmosphere on stage. Um, and that atmosphere comes from two parts. Um, the first part is the kind of relationship between the performers. So the reason I named my company Kizuna um, is that's the Japanese word for those intangible bonds you have between people. So I, I try to forge these um, communities between the artists that I create that extends beyond the studio. So um, most of the time people in, the, in my company wind up being best friends at the end <laughs> or, you know, wind up just hanging out all the time because and that time that they spend outside of the studio translates to the kind of trust that it really becomes a tangible thing when you see it on stage, like the willingness to throw yourself into someone's arms because they have, I mean, not to sound too poetic, but they have caught you emotionally in other situations. Do you know what I mean? We're not, we're professionals, but we're also um, community builders within ourselves as well. Um, and then the other side of that is the physicality of it. For me, I, um, I don't normally work from a perspective of saying like, I feel sad right now, I'm gonna make a dance about being sad. Um, I normally think about the way movement is carving through space and how the, those bodies um, shape the space um, to create that atmosphere. So I'll create movement and then I'll step back and look at the space as a whole and the carving of all of that space then uh, reads to me as this piece is going toward a more dramatic route, going toward a more comedic route, um, something like that. Um, and then I'll kind of guide that um, along the way with these kinds of ideas and bits and pieces of the language and Japanese language and culture um, that the works are kind of grounded in. But I always start from a physical place and let that physicality in itself tell the story um, versus trying to force um, emotion through dancers' bodies, if that makes sense. So you're talking about this physical three-dimensional space and yeah. filmmakers also work in a three-dimensional space and then we make it two-dimensional. Um, unless we're working in VR, XR. So um, how has, you know, the pandemic changed or altered how your process or what it is you're doing? Is there anything that's been a benefit? And, you know, how have you gotten around the obstacles? I would ask you, Cameron, first, and then Tom as well. Yeah, well, the pandemic hit us really hard. Um, you know, even the fellowship we, were, we have with the USCFC, we were supposed to be over there in Japan performing with Sumozaki Sensei's company alongside the Olympic Games, and it just, you know, we couldn't get there, um, and still haven't been able to um, to go back over and, and really uh, get that collaboration going. Um, so, you know, that was a huge bummer for us. The company, um, you know, went on hiatus essentially. Um, everything went over, went on to Zoom, um, and I sustained the company by teaching a lot over Zoom and then collaborating with people both in the park and in Zoom, and then, you know, performing on these huge outdoor rooftops. And, you know, we made a, a lot of changes with that. Um, I think for benefits, um, going back to teaching, when you're teaching online on Zoom, people can't actually see your body, but or most of your body, but they're trying to really get the aesthetic and the feeling of something. It really makes you focus on the actual words you're using. Um, and not only that, but the, but the order in which you put those words. Um, because the very first sensation, the first metaphor, the first idea you give them is often the one that sticks the most. So mm -hmm. again, it comes back to that idea of getting to the core, to the very root of what I'm trying to achieve and presenting that as a first layer verbally um, in order to produce the physicality that I'm after, which I wasn't really used to. I usually, like I said, I work physically first and then right. use the words later. Um, so I think it's made me a better, a better teacher. Um, I can talk about the work that I want to do um, more so than I could before, I believe. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just trying to get a sense of, of how you would tackle that, Cameron. I mean, dancing is obviously so kinetic and it's about being in the moment and it's about sharing that kind of, you know, connection with other people in the room. It's like, how do you do that online? Mm -hmm. But right. yeah, it's not, it is, it is not easy. But I think there's, you know, going back to the idea of community building, um, when you are even on a Zoom room with people who, are so passionate about their craft that they're logging into Zoom to keep it going. Right. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. there's something about um, the struggle that we all acknowledge, right? And so much of dance oftentimes comes to feelings of imperfection and imposter syndrome. Um, and the Zoom platform is kind of was kind of an equalizer for a sense because no one's gonna come out perfect <laughs> at the end right. of the Zoom class. So you're just in it for the experience. You're in it to, to glean what you can from it. 
um, and you're in it to stay connected to your community. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of power, I think, in that. Tom, what about you? Because filmmaking also is a very um, collaborative. I mean, I know I felt very disconnected from all my team members. And, you know, even though we can do a lot remotely, um, how did you conquer that when with your students and for your own projects? Yeah, um, as far as my own projects go, I mean, as you know, the film industry um, in so many parts of the country um, just kind of shut down and still have um, remained on hold in many regards. So um, I ended up, you know, shelving and, and losing several projects, but um, I did respond in my own way by doing a lot of outdoor nature based stuff um, in the town where I live, which is about 20, 20 miles outside of Boston. Um, so it did get me more connected with nature. Um, and uh, that's been great. Um, as for the teaching and the, the film building program, um, it's been actually a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, did what everyone else did, which was to panic a little bit at first and say, okay, how do we keep this going? Because we were doing everything in person. I mentioned that workshop where we brought kids from Japan over to the US. I mean, that was, of course, impossible. So um, we uh, explored how to you know, potentially do these types of workshops online. And we came across this wonderful editing software called, um, oh, I'm blanking on it. Um, it's cloud-based editing software. Um, do, you know, do you know what I'm talking about, Amy? Um, there's a bunch of different things, but you'll think of it. I don't yeah, know it'll, it'll come back to me. Um, I can't believe I forgot the name of it. So That's okay, so much. you'll think of it. But, but, but anyway, it allowed um, us to, to do cloud-based editing. So we could get Right. You know, youth um, living in different parts of the world, Japan, mm -hmm. um, you know, Europe, all over, uh, collaborating in the same kind of way um, mm -hmm. over the internet. And it ended up freeing up a lot of different options. And mm -hmm. um, just to give you an example, we held a workshop um, in May of earlier this year um, in partnership with the Bellingham, Washington State um, Sister City Association. Oh, that's cool. So we had a number of kids. Yeah, we had a number of kids from these four different sister cities taking part. Um, some kids from Bellingham, Washington, Tatayama, Japan, and Chiba Prefecture, uh, Vasa, Finland, and Port Stevens, Australia, mm -hmm. um, all of them sister cities, and they were tuning in at the same time, four different continents, four different time zones. It was lo a logistical nightmare. I was tuning in yes. every evening at midnight, <laughs> um, but we held a, I think it was a five-day workshop, right. and we got these kids to, to build these films together. Um, the theme for that mm -hmm. workshop was resemblances. So they were exploring these, oh, you know, resemblances as a concept and telling so these stories. So it yeah. was, it was great. Yeah. I mean, I think there definitely have been some real benefits of focusing and if, if nothing more, just to remind us how important it is to be in 3D and community, um, you know, as we're finally getting out of this, um, but there have been some great remote connection uh, possibilities. So that's really cool that you took advantage of that. Yeah. So we, we have sorry, a, we video is the name of the oh, uh, we video. Huh? I yeah. haven't heard of that, but you know, I mostly work in Premiere and we're cloud based, you know, too, but you know, probably too expensive for kids. So that's cool. I'll write that down because people are always asking me. Um, so we have a great question. Um, and it's for both of you. So I'll start with, with uh, Cameron. What advice would you give to someone who wants to build a career as an artist? And what are some key traits or skills that have served you particularly well on your path? Uh, yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing I like to tell, like I've been telling all these colleges that I've been recently teaching at is, is your artistic voice and your desire to say something through art is just as valid as anyone, any other artist at any level. Um, again, going back to the idea about imposter syndrome, you know, sometimes you, you see flashy artists or people with more experience or just world famous people. And sometimes it, you can get to thinking that, you know, maybe the message that they're giving off or what they're trying to say is somehow more important than what you have in your mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that's got almost like a trick that we play on ourselves. Um, you know, I'm sure from more experienced artists, you know, they're maybe they've been doing the craft longer. So maybe they're more uh, used to the tools they need to really quickly get their point across. But just the fact that they have a voice and want to say something is just the same as your voice 
and that you want to say something. So if you have something to say, what you want to say through art, like no one can tell you to not say it. That's kind of the beauty of being an artist. Um, and you can really speak to your own experience because there's always going to be someone out there who right. is closer to your experience and not the exact same, but mm -hmm. always going to be someone who wants to hear what it really means to come from where you've come from. Um, and sometimes, sometimes that gets lost in the flashiness of social media or whatever, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, and really trusting in uh, your gut. I mean, it sounds like kind of poetic um, and maybe like a little bit like heady, um, but it really is that steadfast, steadfastness of just really, if something feels wrong or off, you don't go for it. Um, if something isn't gonna value your artistry in the way that you uh, believe it should be valued, you don't go for it. Um, and you manifest for yourself these, these um, communities and these opportunities that really help push you forward. Um, and sometimes saying no is a part of that. So I would say that, you know, trust your voice and learn to say no. Okay. And how about you, Tom? What's your, what's your advice and what's, what's a skill or two that has served you well uh, in your artistic path? Yeah, well, I mean, Cameron, you, you answered that question so well. Um, I, I, I would say, you know, for being an artist, uh, absolutely, just you have to just kind of go out there and, and, and do it no matter what people say. Um, I, I think it's obviously easier said than done, of course, but um, I think recognizing that inherently there are no real rules embedded within creating art. You know, you're, you're able to express whatever makes the most sense to you, whatever you feel in the moment. Um, so knowing that and having that give you the kind of license and the empowerment to just say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to create this. And realizing also that when you create something, there is no real embedded meaning in what you create. It's what people discovered within what you create and how they interpret it. Um, and obviously for you, that may be a different case. If you create something like a painting or a film that may have a lot of your own embedded experience within it, but it's really up to your um, to your audience and your, your spectators to, to decipher for themselves what that means to them. Right. And I think that's really so much of the excitement. And I think that's also something that's understood quite well by the Japanese is that when we create something, it's oftentimes left to be completed by those who are experiencing it. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply self-expression. It's, it's, this is what I have to say. Now, what about you? Mm -hmm. Now, what do you mm -hmm. think? Um, and I would say with a skill that, that I think is really important um, and is probably not talked about nearly as much as it should be is just listening. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think pretty much every artist would, would believe the, the, the same thing, um, but just to, to acknowledge it. Um, and that could mean listening to your collaborators if you're making a film, um, rather than trying to, to realize your vision um, no matter what. Um, understand that that filmmaking is is a co-creative and collaborative art form and mm -hmm. you have this experience to gain everyone else's reservoir of experience and insight through the process mm -hmm. but also listening to the the world around you and that's not an easy thing to do but to try and keep your mind open whether you're traveling or studying a language and um, because in some way you know that is going to to come into your own perspective and inform what you're creating as an artist. So. I would also add resilience. I think you need to be a little resilient as an artist um, because other people say no to you a lot and you have to just say, that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. The thick skin helps. Yeah. I feel like both of you have been very resilient so far, um, not just through COVID, but through other phases of your career. Um, uh, last question before we wrap up, is there something you want to tell everybody in our audience, many of whom are younger people, um, you know, what, what would you encourage them to do, whether their careers are going to be in the arts, or maybe the arts are just going to be a part of their lives in another way? Cameron? I mean, I, I maybe, maybe I'll at the risk of uh, echoing myself too much, but I would say take Japanese. <laughs> I mean, if you have, I mean, you can be any language, but, you know, obviously I'm a bit biased, but, you know, I, I think um, connecting with people on that, on that level, like there's nothing, nothing beats that nothing, nothing um, comes close to the kinds of uh, bonds you can create with people um, when you meet them where they, where they were, um, or where they are rather. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would say that. Yeah. And um, I would say just get outside your bubble. 
and learning a language like Japanese is such a great way to do that. Um, yeah, go out and, and, and meet people. I think we've all learned um, a lot about ourselves in the last couple of years, but, but one thing um, is that we, we are very much, you know, more insular than, than we may think we are, but um, we live in very insular circumstances. And I think it's much easier to affirm what your own beliefs are and your own values are than it is to challenge yourself and open yourself up to something new. But that's how we end up growing, um, whether it's through art, whether it's through going to school, um, is to challenge oneself. So I think diving into learning a new language or, or going over to Japan, even if it's for um, you know a couple of weeks on a trip, um, to just dive in and, and learn something new, I think is so important. Absolutely. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I know we could just go on and on, um, but we are going to wrap up. So I want to ask everybody to just throw the letter A into the chat, A for artist, uh, for A for applause, because we can't have loud applause. So let's throw some A's down there for these guys. Um, it's just been so fantastic to get to know you, Cameron and Tom. Um, I want to thank the U.S. Japan Bridging Foundation for bringing this webinar series to you and, of course, to our sponsors, Indeed and Recruit Holdings. Thank you all so much for joining us from around uh, the world and around the country. We'll see you uh, at our next webinar on November 17th, How to Write a Resume That Sizzles. All right, I think that's going to take a little artistry. <laughs> so thank you all, everybody. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.